All right, good evening all. Um, thank you all so much for coming um, and down and joining Healthy You. Um, uh, and those of us, uh, those of you joining on Zoom as well, thank you for tuning in. Um, I am Patty Roberts. I am the Deputy Director here at your City of Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department. And I am honored to be here today to share with you tonight's 13th Happy One Year Birthday Healthy You. Um, this is a series of conversations that we have on challenging topics which affect many of us. But few, first a few housekeeping um, items, please. At the registration table for those in person, there is a voluntary sign-in sheet. So only if you choose to, go ahead and sign in. Um, and lastly, there will be an opportunity for questions at the very conclusion of our presentation. Um, those in-person questions are easy. At the end, just raise your hand and we will um, address your questions. For those of you uh, joining us remotely, simply choose the Q&A icon and that will let us know that there's a question in the queue and we'll be rereading that question and then having our subject matter expert um, address that as well. So please also turn off cell phones. Um, lastly, rest, well, it's not last. Restrooms are located out these doors here and to the direct left, okay? And please, for those of you in person, we do have treats and coffee and water um, as well. So now to talk a little bit about the program before we actually meet the, our subject matter expert for the night. Um, Healthy You is a program that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the topics that we'll be discussing that, and that we have over the past um, few months are ones that are very real and sensitive in nature. We have talked about depression, anxiety, domestic violence, trauma-informed care, suicide prevention, and opioid use disorder. And those are tough conversations to have. Uh, last month, we talked about bipolar affective disorder. And those are tough conversations to have. But if, if they're never talked about, these diseases and issues remain out and lur lurking, and the disease remains untreated and unknown. So I am a, a huge advocate for talking, for um, you know, talking about these issues. If nothing else, it provides the opportunity for us to know that, hey, we're not alone. And I'll, I'll, I'll briefly share my, my background on that. I do have a personal interest in exploring many of the topics and more um, that we'll be discussing through Healthy U. Uh, just 1,145 days ago, and I, I still, I do count in, num uh, in days, um, I lost my son, Danny Roberts. Um, he was 22 years old, and he died from a heroin overdose that was laced with fentanyl. And um, Danny died right here in the city of Port St. Lucie. Um, and, but looking back on Danny's struggles, as he sought treatment at more than 14 rehabs and recoveries along the way, he was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. And once, this was always salient to me, once when Danny was in remission, which is my term for it, and that meaning he had been sober for more than two years among the eight, he and I had a great conversation when I opened the dialogue with, what do you think came first, the mental health issues or your addiction? And Dan thought long and hard about that. He was right in my kitchen, I'll, I'll never forget it. And he felt strongly that his mental health issues, in, in his case, that of anxiety, presented itself first. And then he began to self-medicate. As his mother, I didn't see it. Um, Danny was very active in sports um, up until high school. And I did not see the anxiety and depression that he had suffered. And for that, I harbor deep regrets. Um, so you see, that's why I'm here, um, to learn more about mental health issues so that I can help others who might be in need. Just last month's um, session on bipolar affective disorder, I, I learned so much walking away from you know, a 45 minute to an hour conversation about what bipolar really is. And that's, to me, the real beauty of what Healthy You really is. It's just raising awareness, having that conversation, and being, being educated by a subject matter expert in our community. Um, so, throughout the days of COVID um, and prior to even the pandemic, the world in which we live in is moving faster than ever before. Technology has exploded and our means of connectivity is vastly different 
from how our parents before us connected and interacted with society. And so many of us uh, feel outside of our control. We feel isolated, unconnected with our loved ones, our colleagues, our associates. And this can leave us feeling depressed and out of touch and with a weary outlook on life in general. And for that, we're going to have our subject matter expert actually uh, talk about that. So today, it's my extreme pleasure to share with you an important message from a subject matter expert on the topic of depression. Her name is Cecilia Stalnecker Cowenbergs. And I'm going to just briefly tell you a little bit about Cecilia's background. Cecilia is an experienced licensed mental health counselor, clinical supervisor, and inpatient clinical services manager. Driven by mentoring and coaching others, she takes great pride in providing outstanding leadership and quality care to patients. As an inpatient clinical services manager, her goals include providing clinical and professional growth opportunities to her team, quality care to the patients, and consistently designing and developing ways to improve available services and resources. Cecilia has designed and developed numerous clinical programs to include outpatient psychiatric program, residential program for children ages 10 to 17, transitional living programs for LGBTQ community ages 18 to 24, and community-based therapy programs. In addition to her primary job functions, Cecilia has been recognized by the Florida Network of Children and Families for outstanding program leadership for her extraordinary commitment to children and families. She is happy, she is happy in fresh water or salt water as long as the sun is shining. Just like in her professional life, Cecilia enjoys giving back to the community and helping others. She has participated in numerous fishing tournaments to benefit Haven Hospice, Wolfson's Children Hospital, and underprivileged children. And so without further ado, I bring you Cecilia. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much, Patty, for that. I appreciate that. Um, and depression is also near and dear to my heart in the work that I've done over many years with children and families um, in a variety of different settings, you know, from residential programs um, to correctional facilities to inpatient services. So today we're going to talk about depression, and we're not just singing the blues, okay? We're going to take a deep dive into what the symptoms look like, the different types of depression, the risk factors, and some treatment methods that are available out there. Okay. First, I'd like to start off with a disclaimer, okay? My presentation today is not a substitute for you seeing a professional talking to your primary care doctor, your psychologist, your therapist. If you, if you have any issues or concerns or mental health, things that you feel you need to see someone about, please seek professional help, okay? And if you are in the midst of a crisis um, and need immediate assistance, you can always call 911 or call the crisis hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. So what, what, what is depression, okay? So according, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, it's a common but serious mood disorders, okay? The symptoms must be present for at least two weeks. It impacts the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you handle your daily activities, including work, how you're sleeping, how you're eating. How common is depression, okay? It is one of the most common mental health disorders in the United States currently. 3.8% um, of the population is affected by it, including 5% among adults and 5.7% among adults older than the age of 60. Um, a, we took a look at the percentage of individuals going to their primary care doctors and found that 10%, 10.6% of those visits were related to depression. A little bit more with visits to the emergency room. You know, people are, they're feeling down, they're having suicidal thoughts, they can't get up out of bed. And right now, resources are limited. So a lot of times people go to the emergency room as the first line of defense. So you see 11.2% of emergency room visits were related to depression. This past year, we had over 48,000 suicide deaths. 
okay? So let that kind of settle in. If you think 100,000 people, 14 of them committed suicide this year. So out of every 100,000 people, 14 have taken their life, okay? Um, so then we're gonna move into the different types of depression, okay? The first type is major depressive disorder, okay? You, you may often hear this because it is one of the number one of the depressive disorders, major depression. Um, it affects more than 16.1 million Americans and, I'm sorry, I apologize. It affects 16.1 million American adults or about 7.1% of the US population. That's a large population of people that are experiencing depressive symptoms. Um, this disorder can develop at any age, all right? But it's the average age for seeking assistance is around 32 years old. It is more prevalent in women than men Okay, and approximately 35% of the, the adults that are diagnosed with major depressive disorder has not received any treatment. So if you take that 16.1 million number, that gives us roughly 5.6 million individuals are walking around suffering from depression and not getting any treatment. That's a large number of people that need services, okay. Persistent depressive disorder is another type of depressive disorder that is listed in our DSM-5. Um, it's also known as dysthymic disorder um, and chronic major depression, okay? It's a form of depression that usually continues and lasts for about two years. We call it double depression because if you have major depressive disorder, you actually have times when you're feeling better, you know, where you're happy but with persistent depressive disorder, you're depressed all the time. There just may be some days that you're not as depressed. You know, maybe you slept for 18 hours today instead of 20 hours that you did the day before. I'm sure everyone's probably heard of postpartum depression, okay? There is the baby blues, all right? And that's just mild cases of anxiety and depression after giving birth to a, to a baby. But postpartum depression is more severe than that, okay? The mom is not able to get up out of bed and care for herself, care, care for her baby. Um, she, she can't function. Um, it, she has feelings of extreme sadness, anxiety, just completely exhausted, more exhausted than what you would normally see after having a baby. Um, so postpartum depression. There are some other types of depression. Psychotic depression, and that is where they may have delusions or hallucinations that are typically um, have a depressive thing, okay? So they may be having hallucinations of something they wish they would have done different. You know, maybe the most common one that I've seen is being at graveside, having you know visual hallucinations, being graveside with someone they, that they love and they were not able to have closure and they're processing through it at that time. Um, poverty, you know, th having hallucinations of losing everything they have, um, and then illness. Another type of depressive disorder is seasonal affective disorder, most often called SADS. Um, we see it a lot in Alaska and in the northern states where there's not sunshine, right? It's dark for many hours of the day. Um, I often say I have it because in the wintertime here, I love to fish, I love to get out on the ocean, but in the wintertime, the water's a little bit rough, so I can't get offshore, so I get a little down in the dumps, right? Um, so when there's not as many days with sunlight, they, they may feel more depressed with seasonal affective disorder. And then there's bipolar depression. So bipolar depression, think about it as two polar opposites, okay? On one end, sad, depressed, can't get up out of bed, not eating, um, sleeping way too much, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, all the way to the other extreme 
where they're like on cloud nine. You, you, you feel happy, you know, you, you, you feel elated. Um, so that's bipolar depression, two different bipolar opposites, okay? This is different than bipolar disorder, okay? So how, how do I know if I have depression, okay? Signs and symptoms. So the symptoms that we're gonna go over, they occur most of the day, right? And more than two weeks at a time, okay? Um, not everyone who is depressed or is diagnosed with one of the depressive disorders has every symptom that we're gonna review. You know, kind of like with different medical illnesses, people are at different stages. The same thing with depressive disorders. You may experience some of the symptoms, but not all of them. So some of the symptoms for depression includes persistent sadness, anxious, or empty mood. You know, I most often, when I ask a patient, how are you feeling today? And they'll tell me, I feel nothing, you know? I don't feel happy, I don't feel sad, I, I don't feel anything, right? So that's that empty mood that, that they may feel. Feelings of hopelessness or pessimism, okay? So they're not, ho they're not hopeful about tomorrow. You know, there, there's no light ahead of them. They may feel that, you know, it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter how hard I try, nothing's ever gonna work out. You, you'll actually hear these individuals say these things, and you may be experiencing them yourself as well. Um, irritability, you know, it, 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 people around you may say, you're so irritable, I can't, I can't say anything, right? You, you get upset with me. Um, you may be described as people having to walk around on eggshells around you. Feelings of guilt, you know, wishing you could have done something differently. Most often I've seen it related to a family member, you know, a child, um, as a caregiver, what you could have done differently. In households where there's a lot of pressure to kind of, you got to make straight A's, you got to be number one in sports, it's that parent feeling like, maybe I shouldn't have been so hard on my kid. You know, my, now my kid's doing things that, you know, maybe they would have never done how not, had I not been as hard on them. So they may, they may talk about feelings of guilt, feelings of worthlessness, right? They don't feel worthy of anyone's love. They don't, they don't feel like they deserve to be happy, right? You know, maybe, maybe they're diagnosed with this major depressive disorder and they're not able to work, they're not able to function. So they don't feel like they're contributing to their family or their household. Um, or they may experience helplessness, you know, you just feel helpless. Loss of interest or pleasure in hobbies and activities. So things you may have once enjoyed doing, you, you don't really feel like doing it anymore, right? Maybe you enjoyed going out and going out to dinner with your friends every Friday, and now Friday rolls around and, and you don't feel like getting up and going, you know? Maybe you start canceling here and there, and then you don't go anymore, okay? So things that you once enjoyed, crossword puzzles, right? Um, exercising, going to the gym. You're just, you just don't have the motivation to go. Decreased energy or fatigue. Not having enough energy to kind of get up out of bed in the morning. So I, I had a mom tell me the other day that She's got all these things she has to do. She has to get up in the morning. She has to take her kids to school. She has to come back. She has to do the laundry. You know, she has to take the animals out. Then she has to go pick the kids up and then go to their extracurricular activities. But now once she comes home, after dropping the kids off, she, she doesn't even, she goes right to her bed. She, she's not even, she doesn't have the motivation to even want to do the laundry or, or take the dogs out for a walk. You know, not, not a good feeling, right? Not, not a good feeling. So not having the energy to do those things. Just being tired all the time, right? Say you slept a good eight to 10 hours last night and you wake up this morning and you're still tired. Moving or talking more slowly is another symptom, right? Kind of dragging your words out, 
you know, talking real slow. Um, in addition to those symptoms, there is also feelings of restlessness or, or you know, having trouble sitting still. You know, as a kid, we may chalk it up to ADHD, right? They're moving their legs or walking around. But as we get older, we, we, we may pace up and down the hallways in the house, get up at night, check the windows, can't sleep, right? Um, just having trouble sitting still. Normally, you could watch your TV show. Now you're getting up and going into the kitchen and coming back to the couch, back and forth. Difficulty concentrating. You know, you can't, you can't remember wh where you put your car keys, right? Um, or having difficulty making decisions, right? Normally, you decide what you wanted to eat for dinner, right? You, you'd, you'd decide, you know, what activities you were going to do this weekend. But now you're having trouble making those same decisions that you could make before. Um, difficulty sleeping, you know, not only falling asleep, maybe you're getting up a couple of times a night, not being able to sleep. Um, oversleeping, you know, keep hitting that alarm clock if it's going off. You don't feel motivated, you don't want to get up out of bed, so you stay in bed and you, and you oversleep, okay? Then you have appetite and weight changes. So you're either eating way too much or, or not eating at all, okay? Um, sometimes I see it getting up in the middle of the night when an individual is depressed, eating, doesn't even have to be anything specific, right? Cookies and milk, ice cream, um, leftover dinner, or not eating at all. You know, you just, you just, you know, what are you hungry for? Nothing, I don't know, right? So not having any appetite for anything is another symptom of depression. Aches and pains. So, you know, we kind of talked about, Ms. Patty talked about it earlier, what, you know, what, what come first, right? And a lot of doctors, psychiatrists, have often um, participated in other fields of medicine. So pain management and psychiatry, what, what really came first, the mental health disorder or the chronic pain? Um, so those aches and pains, did, did you, did you have them before you were diagnosed, or is it something new? Headaches, having headaches all the time for no reason, you know, as it feels different outside of stress headaches. Um, getting cramps, digestive problems is a sign of a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder um, with no physical cause, right? Um, the DSM-5, which is our guiding principles for these different diagnoses is they always say first thing first rule out anything medical right you want to make sure there's no medical cause and then one of the not so favorite and the worst symptom I think for a lot of people is thoughts of death or suicide actually having suicide attempts take take wanting to take their life taking their lives um, self-harm you know sometimes you know, not being happy with who they are, being depressed about who they are. They may cut, they may burn. Um, so that's another symptom. So then we're gonna talk about, that's an overview of some of the symptoms. And again, everyone's different. So you, you don't have to have all of those symptoms and you don't have to have them in the severity that I discussed them, but some level of distress with each one of those. Um, so current, current research suggests that depression is caused by a combination of genetic factors, biological factors, environmental, and psychological factors. So um, if you guys have ever heard of nature versus nurture, right? So nature is what we're born with, you know, our genetics, our DNA. And nurture is how, how we were raised, how we grew up, how we interacted in different environments. So a combination of those impacts for depression. Um, depression, especially in the midlife for older adults, can occur, co-occur with other serious medical illnesses. So just because you have diabetes or cancer doesn't mean you also don't have depression, okay? 
you'll see depression with a lot of terminal illnesses as well. Sometimes medication that you take for physical illnesses, blood pressure medicine, heart medicine, can also have um, contribute to your symptoms with depression. Okay, so I encourage you if you are taking any medical medications to ask your doctor what those side effects are. You know, if you do start to feel depressed, um, if you know those signs and symptoms in advance, you can know what to look out for and when to talk to your doctor. So suicide risk, you know, out of all those symptoms, that, that's the one that has the most fatal um, reaction. The American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, this is the latest data that they've had on suicide. Um, it is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. On, on average, you've got roughly about 130 individuals that die each day from suicide. It's the second, second leading cause of death with individuals ages 10 to 34. And does anybody know what the number one cause is of death for individuals that young? Motor vehicle accidents, yeah. Um, as you can see, there's two and a half times more suicides than there is homicides. 10, over 10% 10 of Americans have thought about suicide. At some point in their life, they've thought about suicide, okay? And we've got more than 1.3 million suicide attempts each year. Florida, threw in some Florida statistics. It's the eighth leading cause of death here in Florida. Third leading cause of deaths between the ages of 10 and 24. And then again in Florida, one person dies from suicide every two hours. Men die by suicide over three times as more often than women. Um, does anybody know why that is? Men often use more lethal methods for suicide, they, more firearms. Um, and as you can see, firearms account for over 50% of the suicides. Um, white males accounted for almost 70% of all the suicide deaths. Um, four out of five teens who attempted suicide had given clear warning signs to individuals. And every day, 3,700 attempts by young people in grades 9 through 12. And 93% of the adults that were surveyed believed that suicide could be prevented. That's a tremendous number. Right? So if we're seeing signs, if we're seeing symptoms of some that we reviewed earlier, you know, ask that person, you know, how are you feeling? You know, is there someone you can talk to? And, you know, encourage them to see a specialist. So then one of the, another reason why we're here tonight is to kind of talk about the pandemic and how it has impacted different things. Um, specifically tonight, how, how it's impacted depression among all Americans. So we're gonna we're gonna watch a video here, um, and then afterwards I'm gonna ask some questions and kind of review it. It is about seven minutes, just so you know. Two. Since I buried my son. My son died from the coronavirus, as I've mentioned, um, but not in the way you think. Um, the human condition is not to be socially isolated. And, you, and I heard someone say, well, it's like summer for these kids. It was, it's not like summer for these kids. It's just not. Anybody says that's, it's an idiot. This is not summer. You have parents who are stressed out because they lost their jobs. That's not like summer. You got kids who have no interaction with their friends other than through Fortnite and FaceTime. That's not like summer. You have kids who can't go, go run off their energy at PE class. They can't get that one hug from their teacher that they needed. Um, there, there's social and emotional challenges beyond comprehension. And we're only going to begin to understand the effects. And it will be hard, incredibly hard to track and incredibly hard to prove my thesis um, because the network effects of how this all happened, the butterfly effect, is, is too complicated. But my belief is 
we are have a bubble, a social and emotional bubble that's about to burst, and it's been coming for a while. I think Hayden was an incredible kid. He wasn't depressed. Uh, he wasn't uh, someone who uh, moped around. I mean, like any teenager, he was hard on himself at times. Probably a lot, a lot like me, pretty competitive guy. Um, and like anybody, had his own, his own insecurities here and there. Um, my son, the story behind my son, for those who want to know, back in December, he got a brand new monitor for Christmas. That's what he wanted. He was a big, big time gamer, and I got nothing wrong with gaming. Uh, that's what he wanted to play Fortnite. He's an incredible Fortnite player, one of the top for his age in the country. And, um, very proud of that gift and, and that one of those wonderful for a couple months right before that the virus was start starting back in february like like i used to do when i got mad at uh, mike tyson's punch out or whatever it was um he got mad at Fortnite, turned around and chunked that controller over his head again just like i used to do and um it smack in the middle of that monitor broke it and we told him son you know you can't do that I don't care about the monitor, but I care about how you react. It's just you can't do that. When you're not getting another one. Sorry, dude. Um, and, you know, he negotiated and tried every which way to convince us, talking to my, what we call, my, my dad, we call him PP, um, trying to get him to fix it. And you can't fix those new LCD monitors, um, or not cheaply at least. And, um, but we said, you know what? If you, opportunity to, to learn a lesson, do some hard work of your own, do some more chores around the house, you treat your sister nicer, um, maybe we'll talk about it, we'll get you one. And he held up his end of the bargain. Um, February, Mar March, he worked his butt off, um, did some things around the house, did many things around the house. Was, I could see it, just a wonderful change and how he treated his sister, which brother and sisters always fight, there's nothing unusual about that, but just learning, he was evolving, he was growing, he was becoming a man, 12 year old boy. And, uh, you know, a week and a half ago, we had a wonderful day. Um, we're, me and Hayden were supposed to go get haircuts at my office. Uh, both of us were getting shaggy as can be. And um, my water in my well went out. And, uh, you know, I needed help to fix it. So I called the smartest guy I know, which was my dad. Um, and I hadn't seen him because of the virus. I hadn't allowed him to go to work. I said, you got to work from home, man. I was worried about my dad just like everybody else. Uh, but he came over, helped me fix the will. It was a beautiful sunny day. We had a glorious time. Me, Hayden, and him fixing it. My dad even gave him a little mission that he had to watch something on the well. He was real proud of that. And I remember Hayden coming up in the kitchen. I gave him the biggest hug and I kissed him on the hair. I hugged him tight for some reason. I didn't know what would be the last time I'd hug him. My dad did the same and we talked some more. And Hayden went upstairs to his room. Um, and. Uh, my dad had to go. Uh, I had to take a phone call. Um, April went to go uh, pick up a friend. You know, the social isolation, we kind of reached a point where we felt like it was counterproductive. So we're going to let her have a friend spend the night and they were going to get some food. And my dad left. April left. I went into my room real quick. Just my little daughter, me and Hayden were at home. I took a call. It took about 25, 30 minutes. Walked outside and... Uh, my eight-year-old daughter came down the stairs and said, hey, did hung himself. And I ran upstairs. <sighs> I tried. I want nobody ever feel this, to see what I saw, to feel this pain. I want nobody. <laughs> and as we found out, you know, we were in shock the first couple days. Just, just how, where did this come from? How this happened? I'm a horrible parent. Yeah. Horrible. And uh, come to find out that he had broke his monitor again. Broke his monitor again. And in a, just a rash of, of emotion and probably anger at himself and maybe scared to get in trouble. And, Embarrassed and all these emotions, you know, I went in his closet and rudimentally did something that I, I know he regrets. The kicker of it was, it was three days before his 13th birthday, and he was so excited about that birthday. Um, 
so excited about his birthday. And he was going to get a controller, some new controller that was going to really make his game, Xbox game better, or his uh, Fortnite game better. And, um, and so when he broke his monitor, I believe he felt like he ruined his party. He ruined his birthday. He already couldn't have a birthday party because of social isolation. Imagine that as a 12-year-old boy. You know, that's just, that's got to be. Those are the things you look forward to as a kid. And then you then you, and you accidentally ruin it because you break your monitor and you aren't going to be able to use your birthday present here in a couple days and you can't go see your friends. Um, and you're, you know, you're stuck. You didn't have PE class to run it all out. And, you know, you know, all those things. Everybody's played Fortnite across the country. Kids are staying up later than they are, so they're... Again, they, they, have, they don't have the skills. We as a society, me as a parent, us as parents haven't necessarily given them all the tools to, to properly handle. And in that moment, um, probably not understanding the, the finality of the situation, went in the closet and got himself in a situation I believe he couldn't get out of. Um, and might have been, been, been an accident. My eight-year-old daughter saw some of it. We don't know exactly what. We'll let the counselors, professionals help us in that. Um, but I know she wants she's so, so feel free to go online and finish watching that video. Um, but one of the most important things that I, I, I wanted to make sure we took away from that video was the social isolation that has been caused by COVID and by the pandemic and how it not only impacts us as adults, but also kids. So checking in with your children, your grandchildren, seeing how they're doing, asking them questions, taking, you know, doing as many activities as you can with them during this time is very beneficial. We, you know, I, I, I've recently moved here from Jacksonville and in my previous role, we had about a 77% increase in kids that, and adults that were seeking treatment for depression and anxiety during the, the pandemic time, okay? Um, Hayden's Corner, um, they, they've created a movement now and are working with legislators and private partners to pass legislation that will federally mandate that resilience classes are part of the core curriculum for kids from kindergarten to 12th grade, meaning that they'll begin to learn, um, the content will be focused on social and emotional development for kids and youth. So long-term effects of how that will help them better cope if they do experience depression and anxiety. Um, they're also creating a public service announcement for educating both parents and kids on the responsible ability of gaming and oversight. But we're not talking about gaming here. That's a whole nother day. Um, but thank to Hayden's Corner for his father providing that video and giving us permission to utilize it. Um, we know um, that mental health and substance abuse are the primary effects of disasters, right? We're in the middle of a disaster right now. So mental health is impacted, substance abuse, use, substance use has increased. Um, and the long-term exposure, the longer we're in the pandemic, um, the more stress that we have on us that can weaken our immune system, it can cause us heart problems, obesity, insomnia, and as we're talking about today, depression. 70% um, of the Americans um, report that the economy is a significant source of their stress, right? Financially, how we're doing as a whole. You know, when you think about the pandemic and if you're, if you're in retirement or you got money in the stock market or you've lost a job, all that financial stuff increases depression increases worry, increases stress. Um, a third of the Americans have displayed um, clinical signs of depression and anxiety um, since the pandemic has began. One in five are actually reporting physical reactions um, even when they even start thinking about it, you know. If you, if you guys even, right, as you were able to start going back out in public and 
you know, wearing a mask. Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? And then what are people thinking about me if I'm not wearing a mask? And, you know, the vaccine, did you get the vaccine? Did you not? All that increases and you, and you have a stress reaction. Um, if you can see text messages to the federal disaster um, distress hotline increased a thousand percent since the pandemic has began. Um, just want to kind of show the uh, emotional phases of a disaster, um, whether it be from the pandemic or hurricane, um, et cetera. The warning, the pre-disaster phase, you see emotional high, emotional lows. In the warning phase, we're, we're, we're kind of a little bit above the middle, we're, you know, we're getting a little bit triggered, experience and a little bit more depression, the threat comes and the impact, and then we shoot up immediately after, you know, pandemic started. Then we have that honeymoon phase where the community's coming together, we're all banding together. Like how many federal dollars got poured in to facilities to buy PPE, um, to, to buy a computer equipment for patients to get therapy at home? Um, and then it kind of drops off, and then now we're in that little trigger, trigger event. So, so we're kind of coasting along right here. Um, and I'd like to think we're headed towards the reconstruction phase, um, but we'll cross, we'll cross our fingers for that. So that's the emotional phase of a disaster. And what do these stages kind of mean to us? As we psychological ca casualties far outweigh physical casualties four to one. If you've done anything with uh, PTSD, any military, you know PTSD has increased drastically, um, not only since the pandem pandemic began, but also some of the wars that we've been involved in overseas. Um, we are in a mental health surge. You know we have a lot of people seeking mental health treatment, and. We don't have the resources, or at least as much as we would like, to provide those services in a timely manner. Um, we also need to remember that although we're towards the end of it, it's, you know, there are going to be lasting effects, okay? Not just for our loved ones, but also ourselves. So making sure we're checking in with ourselves and seeing how we're doing and how we're feeling. Um, I want to go over some treatments for depression. Um, the earlier you begin the treatment, the more effective it will be. Um, often people delay treatment because of the stigma around it. You know, what are people gonna say if I go into this psychiatry as psychiatrist's office? You know, who are looking at me? Am I gonna run into people I know? Um, often people don't want to see a specialist, you know, and they're not treated effectively in the beginning for their depression. More often than not, most people go to their primary care doctors for depression and they're receiving antidepressants. Still not feeling well, giving them different medications. If you are experiencing this, it is best for you to go to a specialist. They did eight extra years of training, four, eight years extra training. They know the different medications. Primary care specializes in primary care, cold sniffles, and then connecting you with the specialist. So it's best to see a specialist for, for your mental health needs. Um, we've got medications, right? Psychotherapy, a combination of both medication and therapy, brain stimulation therapies, and self-help options. So for antidepressant, um, most commonly used for depression is SSRIs. So you may, you may have heard Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. Um, these help the way your brain kind of adjusts to the chemicals and helps control your mood and your stress. They do take time. Medication takes time. It takes a good two to four weeks, depending on the medication, to actually get into your body and help your mood. Now, you may see your appetite, you know, get better immediately, but for your, all your symptoms to improve, uh, give it a good two to four weeks. Um, if it's not working after that time, consult with your specialist. Um, the other pitfall that we kind of get into is after we're taking the meds, we feel, I'm better, I don't need it anymore, and then we stop taking the medication, right? 
You don't want to do that. The medication is helping you feel better. Remain compliant with those medications, okay? And then, obviously, if you ever stop any of those medications, too, it can have some pretty nasty side effects. Um, therapy. So there's different types of psychotherapy, talk therapy that you can go. No one therapist, no two therapists are alike. If you go to a therapist and they're, you don't feel the connection, you can fire your therapist and get another one. It's okay, right? It's like boyfriends, girlfriends, throw them back in the sea. Find someone that you can connect with and you feel comfortable talking to. There is some evidence-based therapies that have been shown to directly impact depressive symptoms. That's cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, and problem-solving therapy. Brain stimulation therapy is another one. So ECT, also known as shock treatment. This is best for individuals with severe depression that have tried medications, they've tried different types of therapy, and, it does, and it's just not helping. It is performed on an outpatient basis. Um, up in Vero Beach, we have a provider there that does it, and you're kind of, you're, you're given a sedative to kind of calm and relax you, does the procedure, and then observes you a little bit afterwards. But you typically go three times a week for a period of two to four weeks. It's not painful, um, and you cannot even feel the electrical impulses, contrary to what they say and what movies say, okay? Um, then you've got repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation where they use a magnet to activate the area of the brain where you're experiencing the depressive episodes. And then there's vagus nerve stimulation where a device is actually implanted in the skin and it sends electrical pulses through the left vagus nerve which carries the messages to the areas of the brain that control mood, sleep, and other functions. Self-help, right, always the best. Try to be active, exercise, set realistic goals for yourself, okay, right? You don't want to say, I want to lose 20 pounds in a month. I want to lose two pounds this month, right? Be realistic because if you, smet, if you set small goals for yourself, it keeps you motivated, right? It keeps you going. Um, try not to isolate yourself from others because when we isolate, you know, that increases our depressive episodes. Come out to events like this. Get active in your community, your VFW. Go, go to the high school football games. Something to keep you up and about. Um, and expect your mood to improve gradually. It's not a light switch, right? You're not going to feel 100% better tonight, but give it time. And obviously, when you are experiencing these episodes of depression, save your important decisions for later. You don't want to run off to Vegas and get married, right? Postpone it. Um, stigma that's behind it, and I, because I'm running out of time here, I'll let you guys, I did provide you with the PowerPoint, so feel free to go through and look at some of the stigma that's there. Um, most people who live with mental illness have, at some point, been blamed for their condition, right? Man up, right? Get up out of bed. You can feel better, right? He's just going through a phase. She's just going through a phase. If they only tried a little bit better, they'd feel better, right? We don't blame people, right, for these symptoms. These are real symptoms, not fun symptoms, okay? Um, and with that stigma and saying those things, people feel ashamed and they don't seek treatment, okay? It's important for you to feel safe and comfortable and be able to seek treatment. And then, these are just some examples. I fight stigma by talking about what it is like to have bipolar disorder and PTSD on Facebook. Even if this helps just one person, it is worth it for me. So get mental health out there. You know, I think the last two years we've done really well at bringing mental health disorders to the forefront and getting people talking about it. So talk about it, make it an active conversation that you have with those around you. Um, and I'd like to turn it back over to Ms. Patty. Thank you. That was awesome, Cecilia, you. truly. that You gave us so much to think about in that video. Oh my word, yeah, so touched, touched my soul for sure. And uh, I, I liked how you brought it home and said, um, you know, think of the isolation, that poor, that 12 year old. Um, Cause that, in my experience, that's, that's what it was 
that's the source. Yeah. That was really what, what, what was the origin of it. Um, but so I want to thank Cecilia so much for coming out and giving of her time um, and efforts and talent. Um, you have a home in Healthy U. Um, always, um, thank you so much. Uh, you're very passionate about this, and, and I agree with you. I think in the last two years, um, this community has done a lot better job about talking about mental health. Um, but I, I, I always like to focus on the stigma piece of it mm -hmm. because it's, you are spot on. That is what prevents people from getting help, whether it's substance use, whether it's depression, whatever it is, is what we put on other people um, that have these diseases that are chemically and, and medically proven are diseases. These are not choices that these people are making. And I think that's, the, for me, that was the education piece, with, especially with opioid epidemic yes. training that I've had, is there's no choice involved. It is a disease like no other. So um, thank you so much again, Cecilia. And there's, there's another portion of our uh, programming that, that I do want to cover. Um, but I also want to um, bring out the fact, people do ask me, why Parks and Rec and why mental health? They'll ask me that. What, what part of this is Parks and Rec? And my response back is, why ever not? Why would you not? Um, and and, and I, like I told Cecilia when I had the pleasure of meeting her tonight, Healthy You is, has never, will never, under my um, um, involvement, will never sell anything. That is not what we're here for. We are here to raise awareness and reduce stigma um, and talk about these things. And, and so by our very sheer nature, Parks and Recreation is that great connector. I'm not here to sell you a fitness membership. I'm not here to sell you, um, oh, you know, uh, enroll your daughter in karate class. That's not what we're here for. We're here to tell you that, that we do have outlets for you. Um, you know, whether it's, like, like Cecilia said, take a walk on a trail in one of our beautiful parks. That will make, I, I, it will make you feel better, okay? Like Cecilia said, just get up and move. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that, that topic uh, with our, our next um, uh, speaker as well. Um, but I, I do like to just touch on why Parks and Rec and mental health. And Healthy You, by the way, um, has actually won in its short one year life has actually been recognized by our state organization and our national organization. Um, we are the 2021 winners of the FRPA and NRPA uh, Innovation and Health Awards. So this very soiree, if you will, um, and the partnership with subject matter experts like Cecilia um, has been recognized as nationally and, and, and state awards. Um, and all it is is dialogue. All it is is talking. And, um, and so I am very, very committed to doing this. Um, I do wanna um, um, bring on one last presenter um, who's going to share a little bit of practical um, and um, well-being tips, if you will, uh, on behalf of our department. And I, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Ann Stadius. Ann Stadius is our recreation manager and oversees our two city fitness centers. Thank you, Patty. So, hey guys, familiar faces, some of you. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, she said everything perfectly. I mean, it's, it's you know, moving makes you feel better. Um, so while I was listening to, to the presentation, I was thinking about an article that Patty Roberts has been uh, sort of an innovator before we sort of tagged her that, but she wanted to do an article for something, don't really remember what it was, maybe it was leisure time, exercise is medicine. Exercise is medicine was a movement that was started, I don't know, a decade ago, possibly. Um, if you move your body, your body feels better. Your body's meant to move, move it, it feels better. Now I understand you, you get bogged down in, in these thoughts and you need help with that. If, if you can get to a point where you can take a walk, Personally, I love my job. I come to work every day. I don't dig it up and go, oh, I have to go to work because I like what I do now. Now, some days are better than others, let's face it. <laughs> People can be challenging. 
pandemic has made that exponentially so. Um, and I drive home and I'm, I'm blessed to live in a community that when I enter into my community, I call it the promenade. I don't really know what it is, but I decided to make up a fancy name for it. It's very landscaped, sort of a long entrance, the trees sort of canopy over. Being a yoga person, when I get through my entrance and I, I literally do this, hands on the steering wheel, of course, looking both ways so I don't run a stop sign. And I just sort of let the stress of the day go. I drive down there and I'm looking at the trees and checking out the squirrels and there's roseate spoonbills there now, so I'm always looking for pinky. And like, I'm just trying to make myself be calm and relaxed. I get home. How are you? Did you have a good day? What happened? Oh, your day was bad. Okay, you ready to go? Let's go for a bike ride. We go for bike rides. Sometimes it's a 10, 15, 20 minute bike ride. Sometimes we'll ride for an hour or two. It doesn't have to be anywhere. I'm, I'm just moving, I'm exercising, I'm breathing fresh air. It's amazing what getting outside will do for your, for your mental state. You, you, you just can see things more clearly. Um, so really, the only thing that I can do or say is to encourage you to, to get out and move and, and see the sunshine. Sunshine is amazing. I mean, cloudy days, you just, you know, you just get mopey. And sunny days, like, I'm gonna put my sunglasses on, <laughs> put my little hat on, I'm gonna go do something. You feel better. I was, I was telling Cecilia earlier <clears throat> that I didn't really realize it when we were in the heart of the, not that we're not still in the heart, I don't really know where we're at, but when we were in the really tough part of the, the pandemic and we had reopened and we were taking temperatures and you had to schedule appointments to get into the fitness center and, and the stress level was just so high trying to make sure every, and, and things were coming so fast you felt like your head was spinning. But what I noticed was recently. So people were testy. We were, I'm sure we were test. I mean, not me, but most people were testy. <laughs> it was to be expected, you know, stuff was happening. But you know what I've noticed in the past several weeks? People are more comfortable coming back. A lot of the restrictions that were necessarily there are no longer there. Um, and people are getting back into either their normal routine or their new normal routine. And guess what? More people come in smiling. More people come in happy to be there, although they play the grumpy game because, you know, I'm not supposed to like it. <laughs> and more people are coming into our fitness centers. Now, you don't have to come, like Patty said, you don't have to come to our fitness centers. Your fitness center is maybe the sidewalk in your neighborhood, or in my case, it's my bicycle. Or you know what I used to do for years? I'd meet my friends Saturday morning at 8 o'clock at the beach and we had developed a three mile walk and we would go as fast as we could in the soft sand. We were in the, at the beach, smelling the salt air, feeling the breeze, not a pleasant thing in the nor'easter, we tried it, but just saying. But you know what, we felt better and you sleep good because you've exhausted yourself. And I, you know, if there's one thing I can just encourage people to do is find something to move your body. Because if you move your body, it'll feel better. You don't have to hurt yourself. You don't have to lift 500 pounds. You'll feel better. You'll be happier. Everything just works better. So take a walk. You know what? I would, I would encourage people to find a buddy. I see you two guys, and I always see you two guys together. Well, you're not guys, but <laughs> this lovely couple sitting over here. For those of you at home, this lovely couple sitting over here. If you have a workout buddy, and it, it doesn't, again, have to be lifting 500 pounds, because I'm going to tell you what, I'm not going to lift 500 pounds. Um, if you have that day that you don't feel like taking that walk or going to a fitness center, doesn't have to be ours, or taking a bike ride. There are some days I don't really feel like taking a bike ride. And my husband's like, but you always feel better when you take a bike ride. Okay. And guess what? So if you can find someone and you're responsible to show up and they're responsible to show up, you don't want to let them down. They don't want to let you down. 
and it doesn't really matter what your activity is, walking or play croquet. I don't, that's the thing with the mallet and the ball, right? Croquet? Yeah, play croquet. You know, play pickleball, play tennis. Wad up a piece of paper and throw it in a trash can. I mean, find something that you like to do that's fun and move and be, be responsible for showing up for someone else and you guys will move together and you'll feel better. If you need help with any of that, you don't have to join our fitness centers. I'm here every morning at seven o'clock. Come talk to me. I'll give you something to do. I'll take a walk with you. We used to do that around this bus depot. We used to get people out there at 645 every morning and we'd take the loop around. It's 1.3 miles if you go three times, I think it is. Um, and we had people that would show up because they didn't have anybody to walk with. And they just wanted to do something, but no, people don't like to do things by themselves. So I'm not really, I could go for three more hours. <laughs> um, and I can feel that I'm starting to get on my soapbox. So I'm just gonna sort of end it here. I appreciate you listening to me. And if there's anything that Parks and Rec can do, our, you said it right, our fitness centers are not about lifting heavy things and putting them down. There's nothing wrong with that if you enjoy that, but we want you to move your body, get good sleep, eat nutritious food, drink plenty of water, and I, I will personally guarantee you that you will at least feel a little bit better. And if it's not true, our deputy director's name is Patty Roberts. If you see me after the show, I'll give you our phone number. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening and coming out. Thank you, Ann. Um, and that is one thing that I learned through the pandemic, by the way, from this woman here, because I'm the furthest from a fitness person that you can imagine. Um, and uh, But that's one of the things I learned is I can't get on a treadmill anymore, and I can't walk a mile. I can't go out for an hour-long bike ride. However, this woman taught me throughout the pandemic, but Patty, get up and walk to your mailbox. That's all. Just get up and walk to your mailbox. Did it? Felt better. You know, so, so even though you might feel as if you can't do something, we all, we all can move about our bodies. We can if, if you know, God, God gives us that capability. So... Um, and it does. It, it really does make people feel better. Um, and so I want to take an opportunity and ask if there are any questions for Cecilia before we close for the evening. Sir. following up with the professional, and the professional is the psychiatrist, because the psychiatrist will walk you through your current signs and symptoms, what's occurring with you, what's happened in the past, what hasn't happened, um, what benefits you've gotten out of certain things, and then you would make that decision with your psychiatrist. Cecilia, if I may. Sir, can you repeat the question one more time? For those at home, they can't hear you. So for her answer, I want, yeah. How do you know if you need the brain stimulation therapy? And that was Cecilia's answer is you would refer it to your, your specialist, your psychiatrist. Correct. And I can tell you for those that I have seen participate in that, they have had numerous failed treatments with different types of psychotropic medications and psychotherapy. So if you haven't tried those things yet, talk with your specialist first and then he'll walk you he or she will walk you through the whole process but it's not like one flew over the cuckoo's nest it's not <laughs> <laughs> i know it's it's not that's what I'm it's pain free okay all right thank you any other questions oh i do have one in the q a how do we find this and previous healthy recordings on the website Mr. Avi, would you go to pslparks.com backslash healthy you? 
I believe every session has been recorded and is available on the city's website. So hopefully that answers um, the person at home. Uh, but yes, go to the city's um, website. Uh, the, the URL to that is pslparks.com forward slash healthy you. Thank you for that question. We're going to put a link right into the uh, Q&A box. Any other questions? Sir. What do you have to meet to be diagnosed as depressed? Great, that's a really good question. So when we had our DSM, DSM-4 TR, there was like meet three out of six criteria, et cetera. With the DSM-5, it is not as strenuous with the major depressive disorders and the different ones. Each one of the each one of the diagnoses has different things. So it's like have some of the symptoms in part A, B, to occur for two or more weeks, C, um, cannot be accounted for by an, another known medical condition. So it's not as strenuous as it was with our previous diagnostic and statistic manual. <laughs> it's a tough word to say, but we're on the DSM-5, yeah, so. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? One more for this gentleman. Got somebody behind you. Do you mind? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring the microphone. As a relative of someone who has serious depression, how do you keep your spirits up to keep listening to the same things over and over and over? <laughs> That's a challenging question in a sense that I wish I could give you one miracle answer, okay? The best thing I can give you is join a support group for family members of individuals that have mental health illness um, because then you're talking with other moms, sisters, brothers, husbands that are going through similar situations and it gives you that avenue to vent and talk about it without negatively impacting your loved one. The second thing is continue to listen and encourage them to seek treatment if they're not in treatment. You know. Is the money side of things with people not working and not qualified for aid they can't get the medicine or the professional help they need and they kind of go round and round with the same it, issues over and over. Yeah, and that's one of the things we experience um, at the Cleveland Clinic at the inpatient center is individuals that don't currently have insurance and don't have the means for medication. Through the pandemic, there was a lot of financial resources streamlined to some of our qualified health centers. So. Uh, it's not a plug for Treasure Coast Community Health, New Horizons, the Mental Health Association. They all have resources available, not only to help pay for the services, but also the medications. So getting connected with them would be your first step. You know, I was reading the major depression disorder, um, and it says at the uh, median age of 32 and a half. I'm just wondering if you know any case studies where they're treated for the MDD. What was, what was their life like previous to that? You know, that maybe you could have seen the signs of that coming, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, so Thank there you. is a lot of research out there with ACEs, so that's adverse childhood experiences. So that's... Uh, for best, it's a questionnaire 
where you ask him, you know, did you go through a divorce? Were you ever physically, emotionally, sexually abused? You know, was there financial struggles? There's a set of questionnaires that can kind of predict if a patient is going to experience mental health disorders. Yeah, it's called ACEs. So that's Adverse Childhood Experiences. Because I'm a firm believer in our childhood has shaped us, molded us into who we are today. And if you wonder sometimes how some people are able to get through the worst childhood and then others really struggle. Why, why is that? I, th I think there's that piece in there about unconditional love and support from their family member as well as their motivation to want something better. Having those two things gives them the greatest likelihood of pushing through those experiences and the disorders. Adverse childhood experiences. Exactly, exactly. Nature versus nurture. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne, so much for that. Thank you, Cecilia, for wow. your expertise, your guidance, and your counsel. Um, in fact, that last question from the gentleman, um, I will. I want to just talk a little bit, and then we're gonna we're gonna say good night. I promise. Um, but I do want to just talk a little bit because we have finalized next year's um, programming for Healthy You. And we're gonna bring back some of the old favorites and that last question, sir, that you talked about. Um, we do a session and we're gonna do one again in May on trauma-informed care. And I, that was a phenomenal session that um, we had, it was Tykes and Teens who did that presentation. And I learned so much about ACEs and, and how they truly shape us. Um, and um, so I welcome you to that one. But some of the other sessions that we're doing in next year in, in uh, December, or I'm, start, I'm sorry, starting in January, we're gonna bring back some of the, um, some of the other ones with perhaps different presenters. Uh, the opioid epidemic awareness will come back. Suicide awareness. We're gonna talk about bullying. Um, it was phenomenal what we, uh, our presentation last year on that. Um, but some of the new ones are LGBTQ+, um, the autism spectrum. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to them all, but um, Down syndrome. Like to be, learn a lot more about that as well. Um, and then we'll be talking gender-based violence um, slash human trafficking. So those are just a couple highlights from 22 um, that I welcome you um, to join us and learn more. Um, to me, that's, that's the true beauty of Healthy You. Um, and the more immediate one before we adjourn is one month, uh, well, in about a month from now, we'll have our last session for the year 21, and we're going to close out the year talking about anxiety. And that will be Wednesday, December 1st, same time, 6.30, same format, um, and will be t uh, presented by Dr. Anushka Marshall. Um, she is the Chief Clinical Officer at Tykes and Teens. So come out. Um, uh, the holidays are approaching, and um, depression and anxiety, we need to talk about it. And um, so we're here to help, and thank you all so much for coming out. Have a nice evening.